हॉस्पिटल गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू वन एंड ऑल प्रेजेंट इन दिस सेशन अंकिता फ्रॉम क्लाइंट क्लाइंट इज वेरी प्राउड टू बी पार्ट ऑफ दिस वेबिनार एज अ डिजिटल पार्टनर नाउ आई वुड लाइक टू शेयर यू ऑल शॉर्ट वीडियो ऑफ क्लाइंट Thank you so much, everyone, for all of your patience. Planet is India's largest live digital CME and doctor-generated medical content platform. Our website is www.planet.com, where we have lots of live sessions conducted by eminent speakers across the globe. And we have MedWiki services, which is medical Wikipedia for doctors only, that also can be in your leisure time. So we will invite all the doctors to visit our website. Now, without any further delay, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Josna, ma'am. So over to you, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. uh today's session uh, we are going to uh, arrange the next session of our onco anesthesia webinar and today's session is very interesting topic pediatric onco anesthesia and uh, today uh, we have a chair person dr vijaya patil she is a professor and head of the clinical anesthesia division but uh, she is little busy till now right now and she will be joining shortly so i am taking advantage to introduce dr jason doctor who is the speaker of today's session and he is a professor and consultant anesthesiologist in the department of anesthesia critical care and pain tata memorial hospital mumbai and she has he has got lot of uh, publication he is uh, also author in the guideline committee member of drafting ida guidelines cdo guidelines he is a treasurer of ida mumbai branch he is ida national west zone member he is a west zone member of sopc society of onco anesthesia and perioperative care he is also editorial board member of ija and he is also reviewer of ija post graduate teacher he has got made numerous publication and book chapters and his special interest in pediatric anesthesia and management of difficult airway and onco anesthesia so he will highlight all the issues in the regarding in pediatric onco anesthesia which is little uh, unique in uh, to manage and to assess the patient i hope it will be a nice session and you all enjoy over to dr jason thank you dr madam thank you very much for the kind introduction uh, so uh, we will we'll just uh, start uh, my presentation with uh, uh, can you see my slide yes we can see yes you yeah, can see you can see perfect okay. so i'll be talking about uh, excision of wilms tumor today and uh, we'll be discussing the various problems with uh, abdominal large abdominal tumors and uh, the pediatric concerns so like we all know pediatrics is a specialized branch in its own and it's not an extension of the adult uh, population yeah so yeah so the outline of my talk today will be i'll be talking in brief about what exactly is wilms tumor and how was uh, Uh, the anesthetic management uh, uh, implications of wilms tumor with uh, specific importance on the preoperative evaluation with respect to history examination investigations what are the various treatment modalities available for treating children with wilms tumor what are the anesthetic implications of these problems uh, the staging of uh, wilms tumor all this will be uh, with respect to the preoperative uh, problems the intraoperative management of wilms tumor and what are the problems with wilms tumor and the post operative management and uh, all along the course of the uh, presentation i'll be talking about uh, uh, the various implications with respect to pediatrics and what is different in the pediatric population with respect to oncology so uh, i'll begin the talk by uh, just uh, describing a case and uh, uh, how exactly would you like to proceed with the anesthetic uh, evaluation and uh, the management so we have a 3 year old child Uh, who presented to our hospital with a huge intra abdominal mass for evaluation and 
that's uh, how we came across so in brief what exactly is wilms tumor it's or nephroblastoma it was it's a tumor described by max wilms who is a who was a german anatomist and surgeon and it wilms tumors uh, forms 6% of the pediatric oncological uh, diseases uh, amongst the entire spectrum of pediatric oncology it's the most common renal, uh, renal neoplasm affecting children and 90% of the cases occur before the age of 8 years with a mean age of presentation as 3 and a half years if detected in time and detected early it has an excellent prognosis uh, with cure rates as high as 85 to 90% however the incidence of intracaval extension since a uh, few of them could be asymptomatic so they could advance to intracable uh, thrombus uh, tumor thrombus and the incidence of this is between 4 to 10% and the incidence of intracardiac or intraatrial extension so all along the renal vein into the ivc and inside the atrium and intra atrial and intraventricular uh, tumor thrombus of wilms tumor fortunately the incidence of this is only 1% so this is very peculiar of wilms tumor that you can have uh, tumor thrombus which can progress all the way to the heart right coming to the anesthetic management um, the preoperative intraoperative and postoperative uh, problems so on describe, uh, discussing the preoperative evaluation we'll discuss uh, the history and clinical sim symptoms of wilms tumor the examination bit the investigations what investigations would you like to advise and the treatment modalities and effects of these treatment modalities on uh, uh, and the clinical implications uh, with respect to anesthesia so majority of these cases of wilms tumors present as an asymptomatic abdominal mass mm -hmm. a few of them could be associated with abdominal pain anorexia nausea vomiting hypertension may be an associated problem and uh, in 50 to 60% of these children who uh, present with this huge abdominal masses they can have uh, hypertension because of the renin secreting uh, tumor of the wilms uh, uh, cells in the wilms tumor and they may cause uh, left ventricular hypertrophy and volume contraction so apart from the hypertension and all these other symptoms you can they can uh, also present with uh, profuse hematuria uh, in 30% of the cases and uh, coagulopathy has been described in literature in 10% of the patients uh, they have acquired von willebrand's disease but uh, in our experience uh, since the past uh, few years where we've been following up we don't really have this uh, coagulopathy component as being very uh, important with respect to the indian subpopulation so it's fortunate that a uh, lot of these children can have an epidural insert in place and they do not have the coagulopathy issue so this is with respect to the history taking bit of uh, wilms tumor again they may be uh, sporadic familial or part of various syndromes so there is a syndrome called as a wgagr that is wilms tumor aniridia genitourinary malformations and mental retardation uh, in 6% of the children this wilms tumor may also be bilateral and uh, along with that you also need to ask for relevant birth history immunization history upper respiratory tract infections medications allergies previous anesthetics etc now a uh, word of caution here that uh, it's not uh, like a traditional uh, child with a runny nose where they will go to preschool and they will go to a uh, play group and they will always have some form of uh, upper respiratory tract infection or the other now since this is an oncological problem it's a kind of a semi emergency you can't wait for uh, the traditional 4 weeks and 6 weeks and 8 weeks uh, for the upper respiratory uh, infection to settle and the hyper reactive airway to settle before you uh, post them and schedule them for surgery because there's a chance of uh, disease advancement uh, oncology wise so if the child does not have fever if there is no adventitious sounds in the chest if uh, the counts are normal and uh, uh, all these other uh, problems are not an issue we usually uh, prefer to take them up for surgery if it's just a mild upper respiratory tract infection kind of a thing so that is important because you can't be postponing these cases based on uh, the just mild cough cold and fever yeah unlike a, a regular elective procedure like a hernia or something like that where you can wait till the upper respiratory tract infection and Uh, more so because they are in the uh, immunity development age group 
where they have received immunizations and they are exposed to various viral illnesses, they are always going to perpetually have some form of upper respiratory tract infection or the other. Okay. So, coming to the examination bit, so some of these tumors can be that huge, okay, and uh, the anesthetic implications of these huge tumors, I will just come to in a bit. Okay, so apart from the uh, hematuria and the hypertension bit and the abdominal mass, a lot of them will also come with poor nutritional status and general conditions. So, if the mass becomes that huge, again, the appetite is different and there is something called as a cancer cachexia. So, a lot of the uh, nutrients are taken up by the tumorous cells as a result of which uh, they have uh, skin and bones and uh, the entire uh, nutrition is being predominantly taken up by these tumor cells in the tumor growth. So huge abdominal masses will also cause abdominal distension, ascites will push the diaphragm up, okay, and uh, they will cause some amount of abdominal distension and decrease in the functional residuals capacity in these children. Apart from this, uh, when they have received preoperative chemotherapy, there can be chemotherapy related side effects. So, in the form of uh, side effect of various drugs, which I will come to, and multiple procedures, repeated procedures at non anesthesia operating room uh, locations, multiple IV accesses for diagnostic procedures, okay, and uh, multiple chemotherapies, which uh, can cause thrombophlebitis. So, all of this can uh, cause uh, some amount of uh, uh, difficulty in securing an IV access. Again, there can be syndromic features like microglossia and hypotonia. And venous cannulation, like I mentioned earlier, can be difficult, especially in children who have received multiple lines of chemotherapy and have been coming to the hospital for repeated diagnostic procedures as well as uh, prolonged therapy. So, blood pressure charting should be done for the child with age and weight appropriate cuff. About 50 to 60 percent of the children with Wiesbaden's tumor will be maybe hypertensive. So, it's uh, important to have uh, uh, correct uh, reading of blood pressure with an appropriately sized cuff. And uh, if they are uh, diagnosed to be uh, hypertensive, then we need to start them on antihypertensive medication. And blood pressure should be optimized according to the child's age. Now, in our series where we've done uh, these Wilms tumors, a lot of times we have found that children with such huge abdominal tumors can have some amount of uh, cardiac uh, uh, problems as well. So they can land up with some form of uh, heart failure or gallop or something like that. Okay, so it's always better to optimize the antihypertensive and auscultate and look at uh, an echo. So apart from the chemotherapy implications like donorubicin and doxorubicin can cause some amount of cardiac problems. Apart from that, the huge abdominal tumors can also some cause some amount of cardiac failure. Okay, so it's necessary to pick that up and uh, treat optimally so that uh, we don't miss and land up with perioperative uh, morbidity. Again, cardiovascular system, like I mentioned, can should be examined for presence of murmurs, failure, gallops, uh, maybe uh, an undiagnosed atrial or a ventricular septal defect or a PDA or something like that also needs to be checked for. Again, uh, after doing uh, taking the history and uh, examining uh, the patient uh, spine, IV access, airway, all of that. Uh, the investigations that we usually ask for, uh, we ask for CBC, obviously, because uh, hemoglobin could be uh, low in view of uh, nutritional deficiency or persistent hematuria. Because of repeated chemotherapy, the patient could be neutropenic, may have thrombocytopenia if they have received chemotherapy. So it's necessary that uh, uh, these patients have uh, normal counts, normal hemoglobin. You can maybe advise them uh, nutritional buildup preoperatively by giving them hematinics and uh, things like that. And uh, uh, the platelet counts should definitely be within normal limits because if you're considering uh, any form of epidural or central neuroaxial anesthesia or even for surgical reasons, it's always better to have a uh, uh, correct uh, normal platelet count. Apart from that, renal function tests like serum creatinine and electrolytes should be checked because uh, if they have uh, uh, a uh, renal function or a GFR which is borderline or if there is bilateral Wim's tumor with a borderline GFR uh, that can be a problem and you may need a perioperative dialysis or post-operative uh, patient could uh, need dialysis so it's important that if you have unilateral uh, Wim's tumor you assess the kidney function of the other kidney so Serum create may uh, be perfectly normal, but sometimes uh, GFR uh, assessment is also needed if they have some other coexisting 
problems like UTI or posterior urethral valves or something like that. Yeah, that would be obviously picked up uh, in congenital problems, but you need to have a renal function test. Apart from that, coagulation profile, uh, if you are suspecting that there could be associated von Willebrand's disease in case of Wilms tumor, like I mentioned earlier, it's relatively uncommon in our uh, uh, population, Indian subpopulation, and we haven't faced uh, this. But uh, if you're planning a central neuraxial blockade and a major surgery with maybe a IVC venotomy or a kevotomy or uh, uh, maybe patient on bypass, it's always uh, essential to have a quack profile in uh, the preoperative evaluation. Now, uh, for 2D echo, we recommend uh, doing a 2D echo not in all patients, but in patients who are hypertensive on treatment, okay, who have uh, maybe left ventricular hypertrophy and hypertension and who are on antihypertensives. Some syndromic children to pick up any uh, associated uh, intra uh, atrial uh, defect or uh, atrial uh, septal defect or ventricular septal defect or something like that. Uh, in patients with poor nutritional status, like the picture I showed you earlier, with huge abdominal masses where the nutritional status may be poor or if you're suspecting failure in case of huge abdominal masses. Patients who have received doxorubicin as a part of the preoperative uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy and patients with IVC thrombus to check for the extension into the right atrium. So these are some of the patients in whom which uh, in whom a 2D echo is warranted, right? Apart from this, uh, if, if there is a decision to give chemotherapy, no medical oncologist will uh, plan to give chemotherapy unless they have a biopsy proven diagnosis. So again, biopsy may be needed, but that is purely a surgical decision. Okay. Uh, and other investigations like liver function tests may also be needed depending on what chemotherapy the patient has received. Or apart from that, uh, an ultrasound or contrast enhanced CD scan of the thorax is important for us as well because that will tell us the extent of the disease, how huge is the tumor. So we always look at the CD scan uh, on our centricity to check whether there is how, what is the size of the lesion, whether the other kidney is normal or not, what is the involvement, how proximal, how are the planes with the bowel, whether there is any liver or lung metastasis, is there any uh, IVC thrombus or renal vein thrombus, are they going to re require a chemotomy, which I will come to uh, in the intraoperative problems. And to differentiate it from its clo closest differential diagnosis in case of hypertension, which could be an adrenal, large adrenal neuroblastoma. So as you know, the adrenals are just above the kidney. So if you may mistake uh, uh, Wilms tumor from a uh, neuro adrenal neuroblastoma. So that's the closest differential. And uh, uh, contrast enhanced CD scan along with a biopsy will help you a great deal in uh, diagnosing this uh, preoperatively. Okay. And uh, apart from that, an MRI for identifying. So a lot of these Wilms tumors arise from this nephrogenic rests in the kidney. So it is said that uh, these are the precursors to develop this Wilms tumor. And uh, when you do an MRI, which gives you a better soft tissue imaging, in the contralateral kidney also, if there are any nephrogenic rests which are likely to develop into a Wilms tumor in future, sometimes you can pick it up and you can do a maybe a partial uh, nephron sparing nephrectomy or uh, a partial nephrectomy in the other side kidney as well and remove those uh, nephrogenic rests or uh, suspicious uh, things and send it for histopathology or for frozen section, depending on what the case may be. So there is a stage staging uh, called as the National Wilms Tumor uh, Study Group, NWTSG, which they call that you have, it's a pictorial representation that you have stage one where it is confined to the kidney only. You have stage two where it penetrates the gerotans fascia and uh, has extra capsular spread outside the kidney, but uh, just locally. Stage three is when you have uh, a residual tumor or peritoneal surface uh, or uh, in the adjoining lymphatics, but close to the abdomen. Stage four is when you have hematogenous spread to extra abdominal organs or extra abdominal lymph node spread. And stage five is when you have bilateral disease. So they may need bilateral partial nephrectomy or nephron sparing nephrectomy or even a renal transplant if it is extensive disease, bilateral disease. Okay, then they may be uh, needing, uh, need to be counseled about perioperative dialysis and uh, things like that. So this is about the staging of Wilms tumor. So the treatment options that are offered to these children with Wilms tumor are either surgery or chemotherapy. 
surgery could be upfront surgery that is primary radical nephrectomy or it could be following chemotherapy which is delayed radical nephrectomy post uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy and uh, radical uh, nephrectomy with uh, depending on how extensive the ivc thrombus is you may need a uh, infrahepatic or a suprahepatic or a cavotomy uh, or maybe maybe if it is extending into the atrium or the ventricle the child may need to be operated in institute with a uh, cp bypass uh, kind of a thing and uh, the patient may need to undergo this on a on pump apart from this uh, with the radical nephrectomy we also uh, perform bilateral partial nephrectomy like i mentioned earlier in if on the mri or if in the ct scan you have uh, bilateral disease but it's limited to particular areas in the kidney you can do a partial nephrectomy or a nephron sparing nephrectomy uh, coming to the chemotherapy bit so uh, when you have a biopsy proven diagnosis and uh, the disease is either bilateral or it seems to be unresectable tumor up front or there is a tumor thrombus in the ivc with or without intraatrial extension these are the indications for giving preoperative neoadjuvant chemotherapy for basically the mass to regress in size and make it make an unresectable tumor resectable okay so this is similar to any other principles of any other new adjuvant that you buy time so that the mask regresses and it become it makes a unresectable tumor resectable so it is usually given in uh, three cycles or four cycles over uh, every three weeks for six to eight weeks followed by reassessment and reimaging for feasibility of surgical excision so if there is a response and the mask uh, ma mass uh, regresses then they may take a uh, interval uh, surgery kind of a, uh, this thing and post uh, resection again the child is given chemotherapy so chemotherapy basically helps in decreasing the size of the tumor and increases the chances of complete surgical resections and reduction in perioperative morbidity and surgical complications so surgery has to be done uh, to remove the tumor so surgery is the prime uh, modality of therapy because otherwise there is a likelihood of de developing chemotherapy chemo resistant or radio resistant tumor as such, uh, Wilms tumors are not very radio sensitive. They are sensitive to chemotherapy. So if you go on giving chemotherapy, various uh, uh, cycles of chemotherapy, uh, ultimately you might find that all these tumor uh, cell lines become chemo resistant and uh, the child will present with aggressive uh, chemo resistant disease. So that is why surgery is the primary modality. And uh, the reason for giving chemotherapy is to make uh, all these borderline resectable tumors and uh, huge tumors uh, uh, operable and uh, amenable to surgical therapy so these are the various drugs which are given uh, for wilms tumor you can have vincristine actinomycin d doxorubicin carboplatin etoposide and cyclophosphamide and each of these drugs i think uh, in the first uh, talk of the series you had a detailed discussion about what drugs uh, can cause uh, various uh, problems so vincristine can cause uh, uh, peripheral neuropathy, SIADH, convulsions. Actinomycin can cause uh, myelosuppression, uh, diarrhea, hepatic failure, hepatic impairment. Doxorubicin, like we all know, causes cardiac dysfunction when in, uh, given in cumulative doses of more than 200 milligrams per meter squared. Carboplatin can cause some amount of myelosuppression, peripheral neuropathy, uh, nephrotoxicity and hepatotoxicity. Etoposide causes myelosuppression and anaphylaxis. Cyclophosphamide can cause uh, myocardial necrosis, hemorrhagic cystitis, myelosuppression, and SIADH. So, see, these are some of the drugs which are used for the chemotherapy in uh, Wilms tumors. And uh, these are the specific complications uh, for each side effect profile of each of these chemotherapeutic agents. So, coming to that's about the pre uh, operative bit that you need to know what is the extent of the disease, the history, the evaluation the investigations and what is the surgery planned and what chemotherapy the child has received so coming to the intraoperative management the anest uh, anesthetic challenges for a child with presenting with wilbs tumors are that they can have various pediatric concerns uh, in the in the form of uh, all physiological anatomical differences in the pediatric uh, population they can have uh, lengthy transabdominal and retroperitoneal surgery in small children and infants. So uh, prolonged surgery, extensive resection, major blood loss, thermoregulation, uh, child can become hypothermic, fluid balance is uh, challenging in children, 
intermittently if they have a cavotomy you can have uh, ivc compression or ivc cross clamping uh, again with children with huge intra abdominal tumors they can have uh, the diaphragm moving up and with extra re uh, retraction to uh, assert, uh, to expose the mass or initially when the abdominal is closed before they open the abdomen you can have ventilation problems because the peak pressures may be very high and uh, that's why you need to set higher pressures peak pressures to be able to ventilate and the tidal volume to deliver or you can chip them on pressure control ventilation with the higher pressure control but making sure that the tidal volume gets delivered when they open the abdomen and deliver the mass that can cause some amount of uh, uh, that can cause some amount of bleeding and uh, uh, when they retract the upper abdomen that can also cause uh, some amount of uh, diaphragm moving uh, up and uh, endobronchial intubation so i'll come to those concerns uh, when i discuss uh, the uh, intraoperative bit again potential for major hemorrhage hypertension coagulopathy and proximal ivc or atrial extension of the tumor thrombus so they may need to cross clamp the infrahepatic or suprahepatic inferior vena cava depending on what is the extent of the thrombus and preoperative or previous uh, treatment with chemotherapeutic agents. So coming to that, uh, when we uh, schedule these patients for surgery and when we uh, ask for uh, fasting instructions, this is, uh, I am sure all of you all are aware that uh, we don't practice those traditional 8-hour fasting regimes anymore. And we ask for uh, the child to take uh, clear liquids uh, like water, coconut water, api, okay? Uh, so for that the fasting duration is two hours that helps in uh, uh, reducing the fasting time so the children are less crankier less dehydrated uh, they make the child comfortable and uh, prevent uh, ketoacidosis for breast milk the duration of fasting is four hours and uh, for non-human uh, milk the duration of fasting is six hours light meal is again six hours but any fatty food or a full indian meal will warrant a uh, fasting time of eight hours so when we uh, you know, have these fasting guidelines explained to the parents and we uh, try and adhere to these guidelines we have uh, children who are more uh, happier not dehydrated and less crankier uh, and in spite of that uh, having parental separation anxiety when you want to wheel these children inside the operating room can be a concern so parental presence during induction is the best uh, form of uh, uh, therapy that you can have so that uh, the child is comfortable and uh, maybe has uh, an inhalational anesthetic for an iv access uh, securing so that uh, if they are, if you don't have an iv access it can be useful apart from this uh, if uh, parental presence is not, not possible due to hospital policies or uh, certain things like that then you can pre-medicate these children orally by various drugs so there are it, it i'll go uh, uh, brief on this because this is a topic in itself okay so you can give the children any anxiolytic like we usually prescribe uh, oral midazolam 0.5 milligram per kilo with sugar crystals to mask the bitter taste of oral midazolam ampule so there is a midazolam ampule of 5 milligrams per ml so that is a concentrated solution. So let's say if you have a 10, 10 kilo child with this 0.5 milligrams uh, per kg, that makes it 5 milligrams is the dose for oral metazolam. So that one ampule, one ml uh, ampule of oral metazolam, which is 5 milligrams, can be given drop by drop into the child's uh, mouth with sugar crystals to mask the taste approximately 15 to 30 minutes before induction. Okay, so the child becomes playful. There is no separation anxiety. At the same time, uh, the child does not have enough volume so if you use a traditional metazolam which has one milligram per ml, you'll have to give a very high volume. And that will give the child enough volume to spit out. And if they have so much of a bitter tasting liquid squirted into their mouth, they're obviously not going to like it and they get crankier and it will stop acting and they'll spit it out. So we give a concentrated solution drop by drop. Okay, so that gives you lesser volume and you mask the bitter taste with sugar crystals. And within 15 to 20 minutes or half an hour, the child will become at least calm so that the separation anxiety is less. And then you can give them a toy or a balloon or uh, maybe show them a video on a mobile phone or other non-pharmacological techniques to allow them to come inside the operating room in case the parental presence is not an option. So we often do this. However, if the IV access is present, obviously you would want to do an IV induction, maybe uh, sedation doses of propofol or something like that in the child, in the parent's arms. 
and put them on a, a trolley and inject a little bit of uh, propofol so that they don't uh, create a ruckus otherwise the whole hospital would know that you're going to be doing a pediatric case because the child is going to howl all through the corridor okay so that can be uh, one of the methods of induction and in the absence of a good iv access we can consider doing an inhalational induction with sevoflurane maybe have emla cream or uh, take the child deep under with sevoflurane and uh, uh, secure the iv access under inhalational anesthetic after inhalational induction with uh, uh, this is more important because a lot of these children uh, with, with repeated uh, chemotherapy may have a difficult iv access so that that can be a concern if you are taking an iv access a week again uh, after uh, giving inhalational and anesthetic there is uh, some amount of venodilatation and it makes securing an iv access easier because the child is not moving you have a venodilatation there and uh, it becomes easier to identify the vein again uh, adequate pre oxygenation in a relatively propped up position will help in uh, increasing the apnea time because uh, they may have a poor oxygen reserve in case of huge abdominal uh, huge abdominal tumors so like i mentioned earlier that the frc is lower because the diaphragm has moved up so you need to pre oxygenate these children well again uh, we uh, always use micro cuff tubes okay because the ventilation can be uh, if you use uncuffed tubes again all over the world people have moved on to micro cuff tubes because uh, ventilation is a lot e easier uh, you are you get uh, the set tidal uh, the tidal volume is delivered according to the set tidal volume you don't get leaks the ch chances of uh, micro aspirations the chances of inadequate tidal volume delivery operating room pollution are all uh, reduced with use of these micro cuff endotracheal tubes and if you see i had to uh, have a picture here but if you see if you use micro cuff tubes you have a, a cuff and you have four marks of the uh, endo on the endotracheal tube and it should be important that when you uh, intubate these children the micro cuff should be mid tracheal and not uh, too close to the carina or too outside if it's too outside you can have accidental outward migration or accidental extubation or you can have uh, subglottic stenosis or injury to the vocal cords but if it is too inside with abdominal retraction the tube could go endobronchial making uh, the peak pressures even worse and uh, tidal volume delivery difficult okay so uh, important uh, word of caution here is that the tube should be mid tracheal and avoid endobronchial intubation again two wide bore iv accesses are preferred in the upper limbs and we should be secured where you are anticipating major blood loss some children may have a chemo port already in situ uh, when uh, they are given chemotherapy and uh, for these children you need a specialized uh, port needle which is an angulated needle which can be inserted prescribed before uh, uh, proceeding with the surgical plan in case uh, access is going to be a issue again monitoring we often ask for ecg pulse oximetry nibp capnography temperature monitoring hourly urine output now this is important here because you need to know the function of the uh, residual kidney and any drop in the urine output will be a cause for concern you need to hydrate maintain the mean arterial pressure which is close to the baseline in case the child is hypertensive watch for hypothermia you can give uh, first air warmers you can give warm iv fluids blood sugars children don't have a very uh, good reserve so they become tend to become hypoglycemic especially younger children okay who don't have too much of uh, reserves so sugar monitoring and agt is monitoring is mandatory uh, apart from that you can always always uh, look at the airway pressures the capillary refill the uh, hydration status the uh, blood loss and in huge tumors which involve a chemo uh, large uh, masses or anticipated blood loss or children with cardiac dysfunction or whether is extensive lymphatic clearance involved or a chemotherapy or on pump uh, where there is a intraatrial tumor thrombus it is always uh, mandatory to use an invasive arterial blood pressure monitoring and a cvp line in place okay so these are some of the indications for having invasive hemodynamic monitoring in children so uh, coming to the analgesia bit apart from the monitoring we uh, we always uh, take uh, have uh, various restrictions with uh, use of uh, analgesia so uh, always we insert in a thoracic epidural analgesia and preferably in the lower thoracic level is recommended okay and this need to be inserted in congruence to the surgical incision so if they are taking a vertical midline incision or a transpyloric incision or a horizontal incision that needs to be discussed beforehand with the surgical team and uh, the epidural needs to be in inserted at a level which is congruent to the surgical insertion incision 
so we always uh, usually use a 19 gauge uh, or an 18 gauge epidural set currently there is some concern about availability of the 19 gauge epidural set only only a few companies are having and a lot of them are not uh, up to the mark so portex which was a very popular set in the 19 gauge is currently not available but uh, you can use a 19 gauge or 18 gauge epidural set and needle according to the child's age and weight and uh, we usually keep the catheter for not more than 4 to 5 cm inside the epidural space care needs to be taken as epidural veins can be engorged due to diversion uh, in case of huge ivc thrombus uh, what happens is when there is a occlusion of the ivc due to a tumor thrombus there appear to be uh, diversion of blood flow from the lower limb to the epidural venous veins in to the upper uh, torso of the body okay so this can lead to engorgement of the epidural veins and uh, it's very easy to uh, damage these when you are inserting an epidural so it needs to be done by a trained set of hands and uh, that is uh, important when you insert a the thoracic epidural analgesia again or uh, the other alternatives for using analgesics are you can use uh, intravenous fentanyl uh, infusion on bolus doses of levobupivacaine which uh, should be according to the age and weight and uh, appropriate uh, uh, doses so i will come to the doses uh, when i discuss the post operative pain management paracetamol can be given but nsaids obviously should be avoided uh, in uh, any case which is uh, undergoing uh, a nephrectomy or a massive blood loss or hypotension which is not responding to fluids so see these are some of the analgesic strategies usually these children are operated in supine position with uh, uh, midline or transverse incision depending on the location or extent of the mass and we use oxygen nitrous oxide if there is a cavotomy and if there's too much of uh, uh, distension of the bowel then we can switch over to air oxygen mixture and with uh, low flows and inhalational agents and uh, closed circuit and controlled ventilation with a muscle relaxant hourly urine output needs to be monitored and keep a adequate urine output of 0.5 to 1 ml per kilo so uh, in case the urine output dips it is necessary to hydrate these children well and uh, maintain the mean arterial pressure as close to uh, the baseline like i mentioned earlier maintenance of normothermia is essential with use of post air warmers and fluid warmers because hypothermia has its own set of deleterious effects okay so prolonged action of muscle relaxants uh myocardial irritability hypothermia coagulation issues so these are some of the problems with hypothermia again fluid therapy in children uh, children we follow the holiday segar uh, rule okay so that that for the first uh, 10 kilos you have 4 ml per kilo per hour and uh, for the subsequent 10 kilos from 10 to 20 you have 2 ml per kilo per hour and for every kilo about 20 kilos you have 1 ml uh, per kilo per hour in addition to the uh, 60 ml that is for the first 20 kilos so roughly for a uh, calculation purpose for a 12 kilo child we have four for the first 10 kilos that is 40 and two for the next two kilos that is four so 44 ml per hour is the maintenance fluid requirement so when we discuss fluid management we have something called as a deficit uh, replacement and the maintenance uh, of the fluids so for deficit correction we always use balanced uh, crystalloids or ringer lactate isotonic balanced salt solution and uh, the the uh, requirement for fasting uh, uh, and starvation requirement of fluids has gone down tremendously because we have liberalized the fasting guidelines and we give uh, children clear liquids till 1 to 2 hours prior to the procedure so that is as a result of which when we were residents we used to be taught that you uh, for 8 hour fasting we need to take into account the dehydration and we need to give the child a fluid boluses uh, before induction of anesthesia or immediately post induction of anesthesia and then uh, match it with uh, the fluid deficit and uh, so now currently the flu- uh, uh, number duration of fasting has reduced so that is why we need to give a lower uh, uh, volume of iv fluids okay so pre operative deficit nevertheless should be replaced and you can give up to 10 to 20 ml per kilo till the desired effect is achieved so if the child is very tachycardic hypotensive low urine output you need to give fluid boluses so as to correct the deficit and the choice for deficit correction is ringer lactate maintenance again we often uh, give ringer lactate or 1% or 2% percent dep- uh, dextrose ringer lactate depending on the agt okay so we don't use uh, uh, hypertonic solutions or uh, normal saline or uh, plain dextrose and we prepare this 1% or 2% dextrose ringer lactate so i will come to as to how uh, we need to prepare this 
and we follow the holiday sagar formula like i described earlier for the maintenance requirement so in case of children at uh, risk for longer surgeries blood sugar levels we need to monitor so always you will have a hyper a little bit of hyperglycemia or the surgical stress response which uh, uh, stimulates uh, some form of gluconeogenesis and uh, the sugars are in spite of the fasting are uh, slightly on the higher side but you need to maintain the euglycemia okay so no form of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia is going to be good right so that is why we need to uh, titrate this dextrose ringer lactate as maintenance fluid after looking at the agt and preparing this 1% or 2% depending on what the patient needs so how do we prepare this is not commercially available in india and uh, one ampule of 25% dextrose that is available of 25 ml or, or 20 ml has uh, 25% means there are 25 grams in 100 ml so each ml will be 0.25 grams similarly if you are using 50% dextrose each uh, ml will have 0.5% uh, 0.5 grams of uh, dextrose so for 1% that is if you have you need 1 gram in 100 ml or 5 grams in 500 ml of ringer lactate so that makes it you need to add nearly 10 ml of 50% or 20 ml of 25% dextrose in uh, 500 ml of ringer lactate to give a 1% drl solution alternatively what we do is depending on what the agt is we take a 50 cc syringe and we start an infusion of 1% or 2% drl so in that 50 cc syringe okay we can add maybe 1 ml of 5 50% or 2 ml of 25% in 50 ml making it either uh, uh, 1% drl okay so if you want 2% then you add double the amount in 50 cc syringe so and depending on the agt every hourly or every two hourly you can alter the uh, dextrose composition so if the sugars are on the higher end of normal then you can um, stick with plain ringer lactate but if they are uh, about normal then uh, you can uh, below normal then you can uh, make 1% or 2% dextrose ringer lactate again uh, so that was about deficit and maintenance then replacement depending on the blood loss you need to give adequate hydration and you need to replace the blood loss because they have a low volume uh, i mean uh, uh, low reserve so the maximum allowable blood loss is going to be lower right so you need to replace blood with blood or packed cell and that can depend on the point of care hemoglobin testing or abg testing and you can give uh, uh, replacement with uh, up to 10% with plain crystalloid and you can also give colloids so in the ch cases select cases where there is extensive retroperitoneal dissection and handling involved with a lot of lymphatic uh, 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 loss and uh, ascites you sometimes we often use albumin although the evidence is debatable so we often use albumin but uh, you can use some colloid for intravascular retention again blood loss should be assessed and replaced with packed cells uh, fresh frozen plasma cryoprecipitates platelets all of this now there are certain specific concerns about intraoperative problems and management of uh, uh, huge excessions of renal tumors that when you have extensive trans abdominal retroperitoneal dissection you can have a uh, huge blood loss that needs to be replaced you need to have lymph loss so that also needs to be replaced with colloids or uh, blood ffps cryos depending on what uh, the patient needs again if there is an intraoperative urine output which is on the lowish side you should rule out the causes of mechanical obstruction like uh, uh, foley's getting kinked or uh, blocked or with jelly or uh, surgical causes of any uh, clamping of the ureter or something like that right so these are some of the causes that you should rule out but you should aim for getting a urine output of at least 0.5 to 1 ml per kilo and maintain the intravascular volume and the blood pressure as close to normal as pre operative levels as possible again when they are doing an uh, ivc kevatomy they can probably cross clamp the keva or uh, uh, open the ivc and uh, uh, they can have ivc compression that may decrease the preload to the heart and cause hypotension so that needs to be watched for if they are uh, uh, cross clamping the keva or if they are uh, uh, doing a retroperitoneal uh, dissection with uh, uh, maybe retracting the ivc that can suddenly lead to a loss in the preload and can cause hypotension so you can ask them to release the pressure momentarily if the pressure drops too precipitously 
again uh, when they are that these are all for radical nephrectomies now there are certain populations where which need uh, nephron sparing nephrectomy partial nephrectomy uh, or bilateral wins where the blood loss should be replaced as these surgeries are known to bleed through the raw surface of the kidney so you need to replace the blood loss again uh, you can have intraoperative abdominal pressure uh, rises because of retraction and endobronchial migration of the tube or if huge abdominal masses pushing the diaphragm up you can have uh, some amount of ventilation problems with high peak pressure so you need to either shift on pressure control or increase the pressure limit so that the tidal volume gets uh, delivered and the patient gets ventilated and this is only momentary because once they deliver the mass outside uh, the problems of high peak pressures will uh, ease uh, to some extent right apart from that uh, para perineoplastic phenomena so if the renin uh, secreting tumors there could be certain hypertensive responses there could be acquired coagulopathy uh, because of massive blood loss and that may need uh, aggressive correction of this uh, coagulation uh, problems so these are the uh, this picture shows you the extent of the uh, tumor thrombus inside the renal vein and the ivc that you may have it only in the renal vein and part of the ivc it may go right up to the infrahepatic ivc these are the hepatic veins that's the ivc those are the renal veins on either side that's the suprahepatic ivc and that is the inside the diaphragm and the intrathoracic part so it can go right below the hepatic veins up to the hepatic veins above suprahepatic uh, veins and into the uh, ivc and jun uh, ra junction and into the right atrium and the right ventricle so this is this can be the extent the last grade 5 you need always need a cp bypass but up to grade 4 you can get away with without going for a cp bypass but the chances of dislodgement of this thrombus should be borne in mind because it will cause a tumor pulmonary embolism right so that is important so again in this condition you will have an ivc clamping which is infrahepatic here you will have a suprahepatic ivc clamping okay and these two may require a bypass so ivc cavotomy with supra or infrahepatic cross clamping uh, because of uh, evacuation of uh, evacuation of the tumor thrombus can uh, uh, cause hypotension uh, due to decrease in the preload to the heart because when they cross clamp it can cause hepatic and intestinal congestion tumor embolization torrential blood loss during the dissection so when they do this <laughs> usually what happens is the collaterals are quite well developed because this tumor thrombus occurs over a period of time so because of gradual occlusion of the ivc usually the collaterals develop well like i mentioned earlier through the epidural venous plexus so there is some amount of collateral circulation and it's not so much of a concern but if there is a patent ivc with a tumor thrombus and uh, blood is uh, it's not a complete occlusion then because of this cross clamping for the cavotomy that can lead to sudden loss in the preload and torrential uh, hypotension and uh, blood loss so that is the time it is important that you ask the surgeon to apply a test clamp okay and see whether the cardiac output drops uh, significantly if it drop, drops significantly you can ask them to release it for a, a, a momentarily and give the child some amount of fluids or colloids or blood depending on what what is needed so as to preload them well so once you preload them then you reapply the test clamp and see whether that drop in the uh, preload is again causing significant amount of drop in the preload and drop in the uh, corresponding cardiac output if that happens you may need to uh, have a veno venous bypass or you may need to hydrate these patients further okay so that is important in uh, ivc cavotomies and in large thrombi extending up to the right atrium cardiopulmonary bypass may be needed for removal of these tumor thrombi again coming <coughs> so this is about the intraoperative management coming to the post operative management so i'll be discussing about the post operative management with respect to uh, pain management monitoring post op ventilation what investigations are needed fluid management resumption of enteral feeding mobilization care of lines and discharge criteria i'll be briefly touching about and i think we'll leave it to the discussion to uh, uh, the this thing uh, for the discussion so this is the epidural 19 gate set that i was mentioning during the course of the intraoperative analgesia that this is a 19 gauge needle with a 19 gauge uh, 21 gauge catheter and the filter and so this is what we used to use but unfortunately this is not available anymore so you can use an 18 gauge or a 19 gauge from another company 
and when uh, post operatively you can do an epidural uh, anesthetic band check so it's sim- uh, in older children it is similar to adults where you can ask them whether the there is uh, pain or you can attach uh, you can have an ice cube uh, or ice test and in infants you can do this when the child is sleeping so if uh, apart from that there are various scales which i will discuss okay so you can put an ice uh, cube and the dermatomal segment and see whether the child moves and then move to the normal side okay so that will give you an idea whether there is a anesthetic band at the corresponding congruent surgical site uh, uh, with the local anesthetic again gentle palpation may be attempted not very deep palpation because this can be painful and should not be repeated at every visit we can give uh, additional epidural boluses and to block 2 to 3 3 to 4 dermatomes and uh, again when you give additional boluses in a setting of an ongoing infusion you should make sure that you don't exceed exceed the permissible uh, maximum uh, concentration of local anesthetic okay so that is important uh, when you give the uh, epidural bolus so that you don't exceed the toxic dose and uh, don't keep the epidural catheter more than 4 to 5 cm which i had already discussed earlier so when you give local anesthetic for um, bolus uh, bupivacaine you use uh, 2 mg per kilo is the bolus dose and for continuous epidural infusion the dosage of bupivacaine in children less than 4 months is 0.2 mg per kilo per hour between 4 to 18 months is 0.25 and more than 18 months it is 0.3 mg per kilo per hour so at no point of time should your hourly infusion be exceeding this dose of 0.3 mg per kilo per hour in a child around 1 and a half to 2 years of age okay in addition to this we can also uh, uh if if you are exceeding uh, if you need a higher volume then you need to reduce the concentration of the local anesthetic you can make the concentration as 0.05% or 0.1% of levobupivacaine if you need to give a higher volume okay and in case of hemodynamic instability in case of major blood loss in case of mechanical ventilation in case of vasopressor requirement it is preferable to avoid the epidural anesthetic again uh, various additives can be used like uh, fentanyl depending on the age of the child uh, we use these elastomeric pumps which can be 2 uh, 3 5 uh, variable rate infusers okay which can be used in the post operative period and slides yeah so these are the scales the flag scale which is the face legs activity crayon consolability these are the various scales for grading the extent of uh, to evaluate the pain score and then there is the wong basis face uh, face wong becker faces scale okay so you can show them a pictorial and as the child maybe who's 4 5 years has to point out as to wh- where his pain score lies again where uh, epidural and central neuraxial blockade is a contraindication we have used regional anesthesia we have published a few letter to editors where and case series and case reports where we have uh, put regional catheters and truncal blocks for uh, analgesia where uh, uh, even that is a problem we can use a parent or a nurse controlled analgesia by uh, using these cad legacy pumps where we have fentanyl but uh, again a mind uh, uh, a word of caution here that if you are giving uh, opioids uh, it, the child needs to be monitored and they need to have a higher lockout interval and the child needs to be kept in the recovery area again coanalgesics we can use paracetamol nsaids are contraindicated paracetamol depending on the weight and age of the child again post operative monitoring i'm not going to go into details of this so uh, ecg and ibp pulse oximetry uh, all of these sugars urine output all of this needs to be monitored and uh, in cases of uh, Uh, on pump and uh, major blood loss and hemodynamic instability you need to have invasive monitoring and post operatively that needs to be continued you can have point of care uh, coagulation testing ventilator parameters abgs uh, and your fluid requirement can be based on either uh, uh, echo guided ivc diameters or uh, lactate uh, with as an end point to your fluid uh, therapy mechanical ventilation may be needed in children who are hypothermic having major blood loss or uh, extensive dissections hemodynamic instability and uh, children who are uh, having any uh, blood loss more than one or two circulating volumes so for a child to be extubated they should be extubated as soon as they are alert warm and comfortable and pain free and hemodynamically stable and post operatively we usually ask for electrolyte cbc coagulation arterial blood gas rfts sugars 
all of these can be depending on what is the extent of surgery and uh, what uh, needs to be uh, monitored again resumption of oral feeding as soon as the child is awake and uh, surgically feasible is uh, uh, always uh, advocated and uh, there is a lot of uh, awareness about eras and eras in children is also coming up in a big way so you want to not have tubes and remove the rice tubes and polies and iv and all of that as soon as possible okay so you don't want them uh, with various tubes in place and uh, try and give them dextrose containing to avoid protein catabolism avoiding hypoglycemia okay and uh, excessive amount of sugar can cause osmotic diuresis and diselectrolytemia dis and low sugar can cause hypoglycemia and starvation ketosis again isotonic preferred fluids are preferred because hyponatremia is incidence is lower and uh, adh is higher in the perioperative period and may cause fluid retention i think that's about it and major blood loss hemodynamic instability coagulopathy urine output all of this needs to be monitored you have to the child if there is extensive uh, bilateral disease you may require perioperative dialysis there may be problems with hyperkalemia hypertension usually in children who are preoperative having uh, this renin secreting tumors can uh, take 1 to 2 to 3 weeks to normalize okay so antihypertensives may be need to be continued for this period in the post operative period okay and then gradually you can taper the antihypertensives and again when you are doing a kevotomy there could be a tumor thrombus and embolization into the pulmonary circulation that needs to be kept in mind other measures like parental presence in the recovery with toys videos distraction techniques good an analgesia splints for iv access adequate pain relief faster mobilization post air warming early removal of lines tubes according to eras protocols and dressing of long term lines is all uh, necessary yeah so i think that uh, brings to uh, comes to the end of my talk and i think we'll keep it open for a discussion so any questions in the chat box or uh, i can't see any question just and i think till now uh, any question uh, anjali can i ask you a question um jason yeah what is your um, what should you say what what is your uh, experience with the anti hypertensives that the children are on are they usually so, calcium channel problems yeah a uh, lot of times they are either on uh, amlodipine or they are <laughs> if there is uh, associated uh, cardiac issue they usually keep them on enalapril as well but uh, considering the kidney issues uh, most of them are on amlodipine and not on uh, enalapril so if they are on or enalapril uh, would you need to discontinue and so on and so on? Yeah, so if if there is a component of failure along with that, then you would need some amount of afterload reduction agents uh, until the child is uh, nutritionally okay and uh, cardiac problems are okay. But if it is just purely hypertension and no cardiac dysfunction as such, then amlodipine uh, is usually good enough. And the other thing I wanted to ask was, uh, how often do you see this nephron sparing partial nephrectomy? quite often so uh, if they uh, have bilateral uh, disease which uh, is maybe familial or uh, uh, things like that then uh, they usually identify the nephrogenic rest like i mentioned on the mri and uh, they core out those uh, particular areas which are suspicious or which are prone to be malignant and uh, keep the remaining uh, uh, kidney intact to retain the function but uh, because otherwise you will either need a transplant or you will make him a uh, cripple with respect to uh, putting them on dialysis long term dialysis so you don't want that so it's a good modality as long as you have adequate on oncological clearance but surgically i think they will need to be followed up for a period of time because uh, you don't want uh, uh, to have a very big gap between the uh, surgical and the uh, uh, repeat follow ups because you don't want them to have a recurrence at other extra uh, renal sites right so i guess some lucky children must be having a unilateral partial nephrectomy as well yeah the, so the best combination would be having it diagnosed early limited to the kidney and just uh, go away go ahead with an upfront nephrectomy without chemotherapy and then the child can receive chemotherapy later so we do have a small percentage of cases who come with uh, surgery upfront nephrectomy 
but quite a few come with advanced uh, maybe renal vein thrombus and, and things like that because it's hard to pick them up so early unless it presents with a big mass the children might not present so early correct we correct. have some questions in the chat yeah. box yeah jason so there is a question in the chat box uh, yeah. as the incision is mostly transverse and also uh -huh. there is a risk of associated coagulopathy so do you recommend using continuous facial plane block for post operative pain relief <coughs> instead of central neuroaxial block so we have published a case series like i mentioned in my presentation that it's a good thing to have uh, blocks but uh, the important thing here is uh, one is the planes are fantastic in children so whether you use ultrasound or surgically the planes are very good there are no adhesions there's not too much of abdominal fat so you can put them but the block needs to act because you are dealing with an nephrectomy so your analgesic uh, choices are very limited post operatively if your uh, uh, truncal blocks uh, don't act well and the child is continuously howling you can't be aiming to him to give uh, maybe only paracetamol and aiming for good analgesia otherwise you will need to keep the child in the recovery and give a parent controlled analgesia with fentanyl or iv fentanyl boluses so if you are good at truncal blocks definitely that is the way forward because a lot of people all over the world are moving away from central neuroaxial blocks but if uh, you are not uh, very proficient with this central neuroaxial blockade is not a strict no no and uh, from what our experience is we don't have children with so much of a coagulation problem uh, as such in the indian population fortunately that's not so much of a concern yeah but jason i want to know if uh, how uh, is it difficult to maintain the continuous facial plane block what we have to maintain the catheter for little longer term in children no or, so you can tunnel them no madam uh, we usually tunnel. put them close to the surgical incision and we can yeah, tunnel them tunnel and we can mm -hmm. fix them well and you can attach an elastomeric pump to the uh, catheter involves a cost or mm -hmm. you can give intermittent boluses so you have an aps team in uh, function and you can ask them to give boluses uh, uh, every 6 hours or every 8 hours as long as you are not exceeding the toxic doses okay so another question is there how often do you get a sluggish bowel movement or paralytic areas in post surgery quite often so if there is extensive uh, surgical dissection and if given too much fluid the bowel becomes edematous okay so it again depends on how much is the extent of bowel handling that is one what is the extent of dissection so if you have too much of retroperitoneal dissection that can be uh, cause for ileus but if it is a just upfront uh, fantastic nephrectomy without chemo just limited to the kidney where you just uh, clamp the renal vein and you are out with the kidney you don't expect uh, too much of ileus and we don't even keep uh, rise tube uh, in such children beyond a couple of hours so you can start orals in as early as 2 uh, 3 hours with at least clear liquids so it depends on bowel handling and depends on the extent of the disease but if if the child has a extensive retroperitoneal dissection kevotomy if you are expecting uh, too much of blood loss if you have given to, to the child too much of iv fluid where you have bowel edema there is a possibility that you can have uh, ileus yeah in that case you have to keep the rise to also for longer time correct, correct. Mm -hmm. okay uh, another question is uh, would you recommend a routine central venous access in these children even if hemodynamic changes are not expected given that they will be on iv drugs for few days post operatively and peripheral lines may not last that long so the answer to this question from me is a strict no that i will not put a central venous access just for vascular access unless it warrants uh, uh, maybe uh, hemodynamic monitoring unless you are going to measure cvp unless you are going to need vasopressors unless uh, there is uh, on pump uh, the child is uh, need, needing on bypass or a kevotomy or things like that or a peripheral iv access is difficult to secure only in those conditions we put central venous access because uh, most of our children will be on uh, full orals in a couple of hours and uh, you don't need to give them iv too much if they are on full orals and antibiotics can be given orally or you may not even need antibiotics beyond uh, the initial prophylaxis dose and if the child is taking orally why would you need to give iv drugs or iv fluids yes uh, can i make few comments here yeah sure madam yes yeah, sure 
Now, just few things. The, the previous question that was asked about uh, facial plane blocks and coagulopathy. Like generally, we put the epidural catheter before incision, before the surgery, and surgeons won't take in a case with a coagulopathy. So you, when you are inserting the epidural catheter, the patient doesn't have coagulopathy. And these are not the patients who develop coagulopathy later on. They are not like liver cases. So generally, unless and until you are very sure about the efficacy of your facial plane blocks, I would suggest that you should go for the epidural. However, again, in the children, when you are putting, you need to put a thoracic epidural. So it depends on uh, what's your confidence or how you want to put. Because the other thing is that these kids um, afterwards to mobilize, to give them, um, uh, do the physiotherapy, they should be cooperative with you and they have to have a good pain relief. So that's the reason it's preferable that you see to it that whatever method that you use has to be, you should be comfortable and it should be efficacious one. The second point, I just want to make it from the posterior, uh, the post-operative management point of view, as Jason said, for the hypertension. Like that's true that some the it takes time for the hypertension to settle. But you have to also keep it in mind that, especially in the kids, the positive fluid balance is another culprit to give the uh, post-operative hypertension. And we have seen many patients who are not hypertensive, but post-operative, they will show the blood pressure on higher side or they actually become hypertensive. And if you are dealing with the kids, then you, sh you should look at their fluid balance properly. And you, you can always give a challenge or a small dose of diuretics, make them little negative. And most of the times you'll see that those who are not hypertensive element, the blood pressure will settle. So especially in the kids, this is something that we have observed, that the positive fluid balance makes them hypertensive, even if it may be 200, 300, 400. But uh, you should also consider that aspect when you are when you're looking at the hypertensive kids in the post-operative period. About the feeding, yeah, the, as uh, Jason correctly mentioned, those who have got straightforward small nephrectomy, not much handling, no retroperitoneal dissections, these patients immediately within four to five hours, they start ex, uh, accepting the feeds. And it's always better that rather than giving IV fluids, you start them early on the feeds. Very rarely we have seen that the, the Wilms tumor nephrectomy patients not accepting feeds. Hepatectomies, we do find that first 24 hours, they are nauseated, they do not, but the Wilms tumor, generally accept uh, oral feeds and that's not a problem. So by the first post-op day, they are, most of the times they are off uh, IV fluids. Uh, one more thing is uh, the Wilms tumors that uh, what Jason was saying, the grade three and grade four, where there are lots of retroperitoneal dissection. Always keep it in mind that these patients tend to lose lots of fluid because of the retroperitoneal dissections where the lymphatics may be disrupted. So they, they tend to get lymphoria out. So in those cases, you have to be especially very careful about your fluid uh, strategy. So you have to keep on looking at whether the patient is showing signs of hypovolemia, what is the output. There may be some amount of fluid which is third spaced and you may have to be a little more fluid in these patients. So this problem you may face in first 24 to 48 hours where your fluid management, the assessment of the child clinically, looking at the brains and uh, intermittently looking at their fluid responsiveness whichever way you can and uh, managing the fluid is very, very important. Otherwise, it may happen that your patient remains hypovolemic, which may affect your renal perfusion and renal outcome. So especially the patients with three and four where retroperitoneal dissection is extensive, always keep it in mind that these patients may become hypovolemic. I think there is another question uh, that uh, would you practice using low molecular weight heparin in children with IBC thrombus and kawatomy? So. Uh, low molecular weight heparin will definitely not uh, help in this tumor thrombus. But if you're asking me that uh, after removal of the tumor thrombus, there is a IVC uh, dissection which has been there and uh, whether these need uh, low molecular weight heparin or heparin, uh, we usually don't advocate uh, giving it. You may do a Doppler or you may do an ultrasound abdomen at regular intervals to see across the flow across the IVC. But uh, uh, we, you, we have a very good interventional radiology team. So... Uh, they help us out in uh, monitoring these uh, blood flow across the IVC and uh, Doppler and all of that. And there is somebody who's asked that if the thrombus enters the right heart, what is the management? So then that would lead to what is the extent of the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. If you're telling me it's a uh, complete obstruction with a pulmonary embolism uh, post uh, tumor thrombus uh, dislodgement, then you need to send them to the interventional radiology and uh, if they're hemodynamically unstable and... If they present with cardiac arrest, then it's uh, difficult, but you can say, aim for sending them to the interventional radiology and doing a, a mechanical embolectomy uh, by putting a catheter. So that's one of the other strategies that can be. That's why the, these cases need to be done in a, a multi-specialty uh, tertiary care center where if you have uh, complications or problems like these, you have the 
ability to be able to manage that that's the so only yes, other sir, thing i can add one more point so uh, yeah, remember sure, that the uh, ivc thrombus that you get in the rcc or the wins tumor yeah. are very well encapsulated they are not uh, they are not uh, they don't have those it's not fragile or they don't embolic. have that front which can embolize so they are if you embolic. see there will be like another kidney like you know it's a very well encapsulated so per se they will not and patients who have got the thrombus reaching the ra have to be done under cabg so they always do and putting the patients on bypass do the cavotomy open the right atrium or sometimes they may milk it out if it is just protruding from the uh, ivc into the right atrium but they are always done in the open bypass with the thing so these patients getting the thrombus breaking away and causing pe is extremely rare phenomena unless your surgeon is too ambitious and wants to do these cases without a bypass which i, I don't think any surgeon will do it it will not happen and post operatively because again you have to see one case of it the the thrombus just peels off from the ivc so your ivc doesn't have many rents so again depends on the surgery how good the surgeon is but you will find that your ivc wall is nice and intact and generally their post operative risk of thrombosis is very minimum i think there's a supplementary question to dr rakhi's uh, comment about the plain blocks so uh, the question is usually there is a leakage of drug by the side of the patient in the catheter so have you found this problem and how would you minimize it so we usually uh, advocate not putting 19 gauge epidural catheters in the facial pain blocks if you're putting a facial pain block you use a multi perforated catheter which is an 18 gauge which has three eyes so if one of the lumen if one of the orifices is occluded the other two orifices will have free passage of the drug the problem where you have this leakage of drug is when the distal end of the catheter is occluded and you are trying to inject under pressure that is when it will come out through the uh, pathway of least resistance so if you have a sufficient length of the catheter inside and if you are using a multi perforated catheter usually you will not face this issue again if you have a leaky catheter it a catheter has to come out you can't keep a leaky, leaky catheter because that becomes a nidus for infection okay so you have a surgical site infection because you are giving analgesia so that is not acceptable that has to come out for sure i think that answers it and then there is uh, another question at the bottom role of colloids in nephrectomy which one would you prefer so i uh, covered that during the lecture we still use uh, gelofusin but there can it can be a debate in its own so people are very apprehensive about use of using gelatins because it causes allergic reactions people may not want to use hemexcel and gelofusin we still uh, occasionally use gelofusin and we often use uh, albumin also but again albumin the cost involved is quite a bit and evidence is very debatable so if if you can get away uh, with just giving crystalloid boluses and that works for you fair enough if you are having blood loss the thing is to replace uh, blood loss with uh, uh, blood and blood products if the child needs so crystalloids blood products but if uh, you are thinking that there is uh, chi mal uh, the child is malnourished and uh, the preoperative nutrition is poor and uh, the oncotic pressure is lower and you may give a trial of uh, albumin or colloid and see how the child behaves if it helps then you can continue there's no harm there's another question yeah is yeah. is so, ppb if, useful in directing intraoperative therapy so so we often use ppb in children uh, and uh, people will argue that uh, all the cardiac output measurements including flow track and stroke volume variation and ppv and all of them are validated for uh, <coughs> uh, maybe 40 kilos and over but the argument here is uh, there is no definite study that uh, pulse pressure variation is a good surrogate for cardiac output so you need to do a pulse pressure variation along with a cardiac output echo based measurement but when you are looking at pulse pressure variation as a trend okay so when once the pulse pressure variation you don't look at an isolated value value like in adults if you see 12 14 15 you know that the patient is going to need fluids so you don't look at an isolated value but if there is hypotension along with uh, swings on the pulse uh, uh, plethysmograph waveform and a ppv which is going higher then obviously if you give fluid boluses and your ppv is coming down and your bp is improving that translates into betterment in cardiac output so it is helpful and i often use it and so do a lot of my colleagues and uh, we find it quite useful so if you're looking at a trend it negates the uh, uh, purpose of having uh, isolated value and treating a number 
Do you often use any other cardiac output monitor? No, not in children. No, none of them are validated for use in children, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So that's why we look at uh, clinical, uh, basically how cold the peripheries are. We look at the pulse pressure variation. We look at the BP. You look at the urine output. So you use all surrogates. You you don't have an isolated cardiac output monitor, which is uh, I think I which I add, is yeah yeah. yeah if I may sure. add yeah. So uh, there are two questions over here. Are there two different phenomena? One, are you asking about the effect of fluid rest or looking at fluid responsiveness using cardio pulmonary interaction or looking at cardiac output? So when you are doing cardiac output monitoring, looking at stroke volume and cardiac output, it is validated in children. So you can use cardiac output. And when you're talking about the heart-lung interaction and looking at PPV as a marker of fluid responsiveness, that is not very well validated in kids. And that is something that we really do not know what is going to be the cutoff. But if you are looking at the stroke volume, why not? You can definitely use it. It's like if you put, suppose you have got a, um, now the flow track is also, we have got big uh, pediatric case series and it is sort of, they are saying that you can use in a pediatric age group about 20 kilos. But uh, what I'm saying is, suppose if you have got a direct cardiac output monitor, which is giving you the cardiac output and you see that your stroke volume is say 20 ml in this child to begin with, when you insert it. And now intraoperatively, your child is hypotensive and the stroke volume has fallen to 12. You know that you give the fluid, you see if the stroke volume comes up. Right? This is you are directly looking at stroke volume. You are directly looking at cardiac output. You are not depending on any surrogate marker. So the cardiac output monitoring is still valid. It is not that you cannot use it. Any other questions? I think that seems to cover most of the things. Did we uh, answer the central line uh, central venous access? Is it recommended routinely or not? Yeah, we answered that. No, I think we took that. So, unless, uh, Madam, would you like to make any concluding remarks? Yes. So, it was it was a nice uh, presentation and overall discussion. Uh, Dr. Vijaya has joined later on, but still he is, she has participated in a nice discussion and uh, interaction also. I think a lot of questions were answered. And uh, so, we call it today now. So, done. It was nice. And we should have more and more, actually. This sort of discussion in the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Madam. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Sorry thank, for joining late. I, I okay. Thank okay, you. Then. Thanks Bye. to the audience as well and to the ClearNet team uh, yeah. for participating in the discussion. Good evening to everyone. Good, so, good, good, evening. Night. Good, night. good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, hoping to meet you again on this platform very soon. So with all your permission, I conclude the session over here. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.